Welcome to lecture number three for ECE 463 Modern Control, System Modeling and State Space. Now for system modeling, part of the trick is how to come up with a transfer function for a system. Uh, for example, a transfer function might be in the following form. This is a representation of a differential equation relating x and y. Transfer functions are used in circuits, electronics, signals, control systems, and the transfer function form leads to cl classical controls, meaning root locus, body plots, stuff we cover in 461 uh, control systems. And this class will be using a different representation, state space. In state space, you represent the dynamics as x dot equals ax plus bu, y equals cx plus du. This is a matrix representation that's the foundation for modern control. It also works very, very well with MATLAB, since MATLAB handles matrices extremely well. Now here, x is, or x defines the energy in the system. For example, if you have a circuit, it's the current through the inductors, voltages across capacitors. If you have a mass spring system, that defines the position and velocity for potential energy and kinetic energy, and so on. x dot is how the energy changes. Uh, basically, it's how the energy moves throughout the system. If I know how to, what the energy is and I know how it flows, I know the dynamics. Y is the output of all the energy states. How do they contribute to the output? And D, sometimes the output's directly related to the input. That's your D matrix. I'd like to go through a couple examples to kind of show you what state space does. For example, let's start with an RLC circuit. Again, in this case, the energy in the system is defined by the current th through the inductor, S1 FLI squared, and the voltage across the capacitors, 1 half CV squared. So if I define the energy states to be the current through the inductor, I1, I3, and the voltages across the capacitors, V2 and V4, I know the energy in the system. What I want to find out is how this does the energy change, or what is X dot? And that comes from your V equals LDIDT, or the current to a capacitor, I equals CDVDT. So, to do a rep state space representation, I'll represent the states in the system, again, as I mentioned before. Let's call that I1, V2, I3, V4. Again, the order doesn't matter, you just have to be consistent. I'm going to keep it in this order, and that's part of the reason to use those indices, 1, 2, 3, 4, just to keep the order correct. Next, I want to find the dynamics. So here I want to write four coupled differential equations. For an inductor, V is LDIDT, capacitor, I equals CDPDT. So if we start with this first one. The voltage across the inductor I know is LDIDT, 0.1 SI1. That voltage is Vn minus I times R minus 10I1 minus V2. So there's the voltage across the first inductor, and that's LDIDT. For the capacitor, the current going in this, this node is CDPDT. That current is a current in minus current out, I1 minus I3. The excess current goes to the capacitor, that's your CDVDT. The second inductor, V equals LDIDT. The voltage across the inductor is just V2 minus V4. And the last capacitor, the current in, is going to be the current in minus current out. I3 minus the current through the 20 ohm resistor. I3 minus V4 over 20. So that gives me four couple differential equations. And note, there are other ways to do this. I could use Laplace transforms, do Laplace impedances, write the voltage node equation, solve. That'll take about half an hour. With this approach, it's actually pretty straightforward. To find the energy states to be the current through the inductors, voltage across capacitors, uh, take the derivative. Find the voltage across the inductor, that's LDIDT, the current to the capacitor, CDVDT, and I get my four coupled differential equations. Now to put those together and find the transfer function, I'm going to use state space. For a state space, I'm going to take those four equations, solve for the four derivatives. Now we'll put this in matrix form. For example, the first equation is I1 dot is 10 V in, there's the 10, minus 10 V2, minus 100 V1. And I need the zeros, saying that I3 and V4 don't affect that equation. The second equation, V2 dot is 10 I1 minus 10 I3. So here's V2 dot is 10 I1 
minus 10 i3, third column is i3, and so on. Put those together, I get the system dynamics. Your x dot equals ax plus bu, so here's a and here's b. The output depends upon what you're measuring. In this case, my output is just v4. So of those four states, I want to pick off v4. Uh, this could actually depend upon what you're measuring. If I want to measure v2, it would be 0, 1, 0, 0, pick off v2. If I want to measure the voltage across this inductor, it'd be v2 minus v4, 0, 1, 0, minus 1. Again, the seed matrix says, where did you put the oscilloscope probe? What are you measuring? So I now have A, B, C, D. I can throw that in MATLAB and find the transfer function. So in MATLAB, I input, here's A, here's B, here's C, here's D. Input the system as state space. And I just use G4 to tell me this is a fourth order system. Once I have the system into MATLAB, let's find the transfer function in terms of zeros and poles. And there it is, voila. From that, I can tell you how it's going to behave. Here's my dominant pole. This is the settling time will roughly be 4 over 0.5, about 8 seconds. And the DC gain is 0.667. So this should, uh, if you give it a step input, it should go to 0.667 and settle out in about 8 seconds. And I can check that in MATLAB. If I take the first order approximation, the same DC gain, same dominant pole, there's my first order approximation. Take the step response of the fourth order system, take the step response of the first order system, plot the two together, that's what you get. And you can see that, uh, yeah, the first order approximation works pretty well. The fourth order system actually has this ringing on top. That ringing is due to this pole. Again, uh, kind of rule of thumb, if a pole is 3 to 10 times faster, you can, you can ignore it. This pole has about the same settling time. Um, it's going to be half of 0 0.75, 0 0.37, and a complex part. That's what we're seeing right here. There's ringing. That's a complex part. About the same settling time. So this actually has a complex pole plus the real pole. Yeah, maybe third order approximation would be better. But the first order approximation captures the shape pretty well. Again, notice this is an advantage of state space. I wanted to find the transfer function for the circuit. Again, if I use the techniques from circuits 1 or circuits 2, it'd take me about half an hour. In state space, the equations are pretty straightforward. Once you have MATLAB, throwing it into MATLAB, find the transfer function is pretty easy. MATLAB makes this actually a really easy problem, but you got to use state space to do it that way. Let's look at a harder problem. That was for a fourth order system. Now here's the tenth order system. This is where MATLAB and state space really shine. Again, I could solve this using Laplace transforms, have the capacitance go to 1 over CS, write your node equations, solve 10 equations. Right about two hours later, you get an answer. In state space, I can do it in a couple seconds. To find the transfer function for this guy, what I want to do is the same as before. The energy states will be the voltages across the capacitors, V1, V2, V3, and so on. I want to find out what is the current of the capacitor, CDBDT. That current, like over here at node 2, IC2, is going to be IA plus IB plus IC. Those three sum together and wind up in IC2. So to write the node equations, uh, since all the elements are the same, I can just write the node equations for node 2 and repeat. At node 2, the current from the left is V1 minus V2 over 1. Current from the 50 ohm resistor is 0 minus V2 over 50. Current from the right is V3 minus V2 over 1. Those three add up and become IC, which is CDVDT. Since C is 0.1, divide through by 0.1, and I get this differential equation. That gets repeated for nodes 1 through 9, just change the indices. The 10th node is slightly different. The 10th node doesn't have that extra 1 ohm resistor on the right. So if this term disappears, I'm going to wind up with just two terms, and it'll be 10 minus 10.2. Essentially what these numbers tell you is that if I raise the voltage on V2, I lose 20.2 units of current. 10 goes left, 10 goes right. The extra 0.2 goes to that 50 ohm resistor. 
So once I get the dynamics, I can input that into MATLAB. A will be a 10 by 10 matrix, which you can input if you want. Or a shortcut, this is where for loops are really useful. I'm going to start out with a 10 by 10 matrix. Almost all the elements are zero, just meaning that most nodes aren't connected, just the nodes and their neighbors are connected. So this is sort of a diagonal matrix. Uh, for the first nine entries, the diagonal is minus 20.2, and the off diagonal is 10. The last entry is the oddity, that's only 10.2. Again, the reason for that is I've got two resistors attached to each node except the last node. The last node only has one, so I have, if I raise the voltage on node 10, 10.2 units of current leave, 10 goes left, the extra 0.2 goes to the 50 ohms, and there is nothing to the right. So there's your A matrix. Input the B matrix, C matrix, D matrix, and so on. Okay, the B matrix comes from here. The first node's attached to B0. Nobody else is. So I get an input matrix for node 1. That gives you this term. And the C matrix is, of those 10 voltages, which one am I looking at? In this case, my output is node 10. So there's my C matrix. Now, find the transfer function. Okay, this is really where MATLAB shines. This is a really nasty problem if you have to do it by hand. Probably could take you about two hours. In MATLAB, once I have A, B, C, D, just input the system into MATLAB. Uh, find the DC gain. You can find G of S at S equals zero. DC gain is 0.43. And now find the transfer function. Given G of S, convert it to zeros and poles form. And what you see is I have 10 poles. Here's a fast pole at minus 39. Here's a slow pole at 0.42. Here's my dominant pole. The dominant pole is the one closest to the origin. What that tells you is that this should behave like a first order system. Again, I've got a single dominant pole. The DC gain should be 0.435. And the settling time should be about 9.44 seconds for the dominant pole. So this will have the step response almost the same as that first order system. And you can check. In MATLAB, let's take a first order approximation. Same dominant pole, same DC gain. Find the step response of the first order system. Find the step response of the tenth order system. And note the two are almost the same. So again, first order approximation, the dominant pole, is a pretty good representation for how the system behaves. That's again the power of dominant poles. Uh, trying to understand how a 10th order differential equation behaves is beyond me. Understanding a first order system, I can understand first order systems. It's like an RC filter. I'm going to charge up to 0.43 volts. It's going to take um, about 10 seconds. That's the red line. Do a third example. If I have a mass spring system, and there's a couple ways to do this. In physics, you model this using free body diagrams. Another way to do that, in 461, we draw the circuit equivalent, figuring we're electrical engineers, we're pretty good at circuits. If I draw the circuit equivalent, I get the equations right. And what really matters most with MATLAB is get the equations right. It doesn't really matter how many equations you have. Get the equations right, and MATLAB can handle it. And because MATLAB can handle 2 by 2 systems, 10 by 10 systems, 50 by 50 systems, the order really doesn't matter with MATLAB. What's important is get the equations right. Now to draw the circuit equivalent, I'm going to use uh, the electrical dual for the circuit. From circuits, V equals IR, or current is admittance times voltage. If I use that as a dual for force is mass times acceleration, then current means force, voltage is position, and then all these guys, like mass times acceleration, that's your admittance. Okay, it's not an impedance, it's actually admittance. There is a difference. Uh, no one else in the world knows the difference between admittance and impedance. Electrical engineers know the difference, though. Uh, so again, what all these terms are going to find are admittances. That matters because, again, it's going to be admittance times voltage is current. Uh, the admittances, then, are force is mass times acceleration, or the second derivative of x. So the admittance for a mass is ms squared. For friction, force is B times velocity. Velocity is B times S times X. So the admittance for a friction is BS. 
and a spring, force is k times x. Take an object and stretch it, the force is proportional to distance, that's your spring constant k. So drawing the circuit equivalent, what I'll do is I'll take each mass, each mass has a position, that's my voltage node. I've got two voltage nodes and ground. I will take this guy, draw the first draw the voltages or the masses relative to ground. That's related to Einstein's theory of relativity. The masses don't depend upon each other. If mass two didn't exist, mass one would still have inertia. So take the masses relative to non-accelerating reference frame or ground, mass two to ground. At mass one, I've got a spring K1 to ground. I've got friction B1 to ground. I've got a force on mass one. Uh, to get the direction of the arrow, and as the force increases, if the force is positive, the displacement is positive. If the current is positive, it raises the voltage, x1. So that's consistent. Again, you got a 50-50 shot. It's either up or down. As long as you're consistent, increasing current increases voltage, increasing force increases displacement, you got it right. Between mass 1 and mass 2, I've got friction. B3S. I've got a spring, K2. At mass 2, I've got friction to ground, B2S. I've got a spring to ground, K3. And that's everyone. So here's my circuit equivalent. Now write your voltage node equation. Just remember these are admittances. So the current from the node, current is admittance times voltage, not divide. So when you write the node equations at node 1, I'll have all the emissions attached to it. K1 plus B1S plus M2S squared plus B3S plus K2 attached to node 1. Between node 1 and 2, I get minus K2 minus B3S attached to node 2 is the current to the node, force. Likewise, at node 2, all the emissions attached to the node, K3 plus B3S plus K2 plus B2S plus M2S squared minus the immenses between nodes is the current to the node, or zero. So these are my differential equations, or my voltage node equations. To put that in state space, in this case I have to use a little bit of a trick. My energy states are position and velocity, potential energy and kinetic energy. My differential equations tell me the change in kinetic energy. Change in X, SX1 and change in SX2. Uh, so they'll tell me the last two rows. The first two rows come from the derivative of x1 is the third state. Derivative of x2 is the fourth state. So with mass spring systems, you always have this form. I've got a zero matrix, identity matrix. That just tells you that the first two states are related to the second two states by a derivative. Where the information is, where these equations come into play, are the second set of equations, the bottom rows. And solving, I get S squared X1 is equal to K1 minus K1 plus K2 over M1, X1. Uh, let's see, plus K2 over M1, X2, minus B1 plus B3 over M1 times SX1. There's the S, X1, here's the SX1, plus B3, SX2, there's B3, SX2, and so on. You can notice here's your spring matrix, here's your friction matrix, negative on the diagonal, negative on the diagonal. That's just kind of one way to check your answers. If I plug in numbers, like if it's uh, one kilogram masses, friction is two newtons per meter per second, spring constant is 10 newtons per meter, and my output is state x2. I'll get these numbers. Now I can input that into MATLAB. In MATLAB I just input the system, a, b, c, d, find, input that as state space, then convert to zeros, poles, and gain, and I have two sets of complex poles. The eigenvalues are at minus 1 plus minus j3, minus 3 j plus minus j4.58. Uh, really the this, these are pretty much all the same magnitude, so there's really four dominant poles. If I were to say this guy is close to the origin, it's more dominant than that pole, though it's kind of hard to ignore this one. 
If I chose the second order approximation, I'd want to keep this pole, the pole closest to the origin. What that tells me is the settling time will be roughly four seconds. It lost late at three radians per second. And the DC gain is something. If I plot the step response then, here's the actual fourth order system. Here's the second order approximation. And notice I've got this, the correct DC gain because I forced the DC gain to be the same. I've got the same frequency of oscillation. I've got the same settling time. It's a pretty good approximation for the system, even though this is only about three times faster. And also note that I was able to find the transfer function pretty easily using a MATLAB. So in summary, state space makes modeling RLC circuits much, much easier, where the, here are the states are the energy in the system. That's the current and inductors, voltage across capacitors. State space also makes modeling mass spring systems fairly easy. I just convert to a circuit equivalent and write the node equations. With MATLAB, I can find the dynamics of 10th order systems pretty easily. What's most important is to get the equations right. If I get the equations right, then MATLAB can input the system and find the transfer function and find the poles. Again, what's most important though, get the equations right. So that's lecture number three for ECE 463 Modern Control, um, System Modeling, and State Space.